Modarchitecture.com. Hi, and welcome to Architects Not Architecture from Hamburg. My name is Fermin Tribaldos, and I will be your host today. First of all, thank you for watching and participating. This November, Architects Not Architecture, or ANA, is turning five. So thank you all for coming to our birthday party. We will keep this party going for a couple of months and celebrate our anniversary with something special, a virtual world tour. The first event of the tour is going to be with two excellent architects from Australia. It's a huge honor to have Kerstin Thompson and Young World with us today. With this new event series, we will virtually travel to different countries and meet some of their most relevant architects. The next two stops are going to be Singapore on November 25th and the Beijing and London together on November 26th. You can find the information and register on our website. So dear participant, are you new to the community or do you already know this event format? Okay, if you have never heard of Architects Not Architecture and you are here only because of the speakers Kerstin Thompson and John Worrell, can you please raise your hand? I cannot see you, but there are so many attendees from different parts of the world. Let me introduce to you what Architects not architecture is and how it works. At Architects Not Architecture, we do not focus on architectural projects, but on the individuals who design them and build them. We normally know the projects and awards of renowned architects, but what we often miss out on are the people behind them. It is them are the unique career paths which influences how they work and what they create. So we try to bring to the stage what too often remains unseen. Today, the speakers will talk about their career paths, influences and the experiences that shaped them and made them become who they are today. And yeah, the main rule is the speakers are not allowed to talk about their own projects. It's very nice to see that there are so many people from different parts of the world joining us today. This is what is good about hosting a digital event, that we, got, that we can connect with people from all around the world. At this time of the year, we would have been hosting events in different European cities, as we did the last couple of years, and the event would have been limited to the local architecture community. It is great to be able to reach to all of you at once, and hopefully you will be able to join us again when we hold an event, a physical event near you in the future. To all of you, the new and the old ones, welcome. We are a team of five. Four of us are working behind the scenes today. Kim, Fran, Yuri and Irene. Kim and Fran are basically magicians. They are doing the live stream editing from Barcelona, Spain. I'm in front of the camera, but all of this would not be possible without the whole team. We would also like to mention the support of our partners. This event is kindly supported by the Australian Institute of Architects and our media partners, Design Boom and Design Anthology. And now we are about to start. Today, we are welcoming our speakers, Kerstin Thompson and John Worrell, who will join us live from Melbourne. The two of them will have 30 minutes on our virtual stage, 20 minutes to give a talk, followed by a 10 minute interview. After the two talks, we will have a round of discussion and we look forward to your questions. So make sure to get ready and use the box on our website to send in your questions. You will find it on the right side when it's scrolling down. So that's the plan for today. Let's go! Our first speaker 
was born in Melbourne. She studied architecture at the Royal Melbourne Institute of Technology. In 1994, she founded her own practice, Kerstin Thompson Architects, an award-winning Melbourne-based practice with focus on architecture, landscape, and urban design. She is a passionate defender of civic space and advocate for extracting new life from built heritage with projects like the redevelopment of the Broad Meadows Town Hall, which won the 2020 Victorian Architecture Medal. Some of her remarkable projects are the Broad Meadows Town Hall that I just mentioned, the Hanging Rock House Tarawara One Yard, the private Melbourne Women's Club, and the Country Villa. In recognition for the work of her practice, contribution to the profession, and its education, she was elevated to Life Fellow by the Australian Institute of Architects in 2017. We are very proud of having her with us today. Welcome, Kerstin Thompson. What an irresistible invitation to present one's intellectual biography. So thank you, Furman, and your team at Architects Not Architecture to reflect on why the work of my practice is what it is or has been what's guided its intents and preoccupations. So here are some of my paths. There could be many more, but we might touch on that in the conversation to follow. Robin Boyd is arguably the influential architect there has been in Australia, certainly in Melbourne. And for a long time, I thought I'd been conceived in a Robin Boyd building, um, the Black Dolphin Motel to be specific. I was under the architecturally romantic misapprehension that my earliest beginnings, I had been uh, from the earliest beginnings, I'd been infiltrated by Boydisms and that this encountered in part for the affinity I feel for his work. My mother has since confirmed that Marimbula, where the hotel is, was not the place. But I have a deeper consideration to understanding the nature of this infinity and have come to recognise that it's both viscerally personal and rationally professional. I did at least stay there once as a very young child. And I remember the relief of shade the room offered from the beachside heat, the grazing of arms on bagged brick walls, looking up at a black and white ceiling as I daydreamed from my bed below. Family stuff sat on the timber bench that ran along the wall from inside to out. I recall now the informal landscape of banksies and gums with butterfly chairs slouching out the front of the unit seeming loosely perfect and my father encouraging me to record the time each evening that the cicadas started their chorus. Fifteen years later, I worked there in the restaurant over summer. The architecture was a bonus that came with a job. It seemed a treat to scurry below and inhabit the dark stained timber beams of um, the dining room to park each day before, beside the telegraph pole columns, lean warmth. I think I absorbed some early lessons in living through feeling the spirit that came from this combination of, in Boyd's words, space, structure and surface. It makes me speculate on the permeability between ourselves and the buildings we inhabit, how they become embedded in us and formative of the spatial repertoire that we play out through our work years on. Our buildings are perhaps the culmination of this overlap of childhood, life or spatial experience with the formal education of an architect. And it's this I want to trace tonight. So um, the infiltration of that on our own work. Yet Boyd's mantra to do the essential thing as simply and purely as possible was challenged by my training. Mid 80s, in pluralist, additive, some would argue excessive Melbourne, a culture fostered by RMIT where I became a pracademic and taught for many years and continue there as an adjunct professor. Here the model was design teaching by leading design practitioners of our city. At the academy and industry were not considered separate, but rather entwined and each informing the other. Venturi Scott Brown's Learning from Las Vegas was a preeminent text in our quest for local architecture and the decorated shed one hands down over the duck. A challenge to Frampton's uh, more crafted vernacular critical regionalism at the time, instead we celebrated the ugly and the ordinary, the prosaic tropes and defaults of a suburban vernacular. Sorry. 
Um, Peter Corrigan led this quest and was a big influence on me, less on form and more on method. He drew my attention to the local and helped me solve a predicament of architecture. On the one hand, I'd been formed by the aesthetics training and inheritance of the global discipline in architecture with all its richness and traditions. And I'm grateful through Corrigan's 20th century history that I inherited people like Aspland, Haring, Sharoon, Barrigan and so on. On the other hand, my skills, my location and histories were particular to here. So my desire to intervene in place was to be irreducibly local and specific. So Peter directed an interest in a deliberately parochial understanding of context to understand or examine what constitutes localness and foster this through architecture. He expanded the grammar of architecture to speak a dialect inflected by here. And their fire stations that you can see, these images became key reference points for our series of police stations. It showed a way to counter suburban as a generic condition and demonstrate instead how architecture of modest civic buildings could dignify the experience of the everyday and the ordinary in our suburbs and towns. But if I respected the intellectual provocation of Edmund and Corrigan, I felt pure experiential joy in being within, encompassed by the form and material of Robinson Chen's houses, another practice locally I was profoundly influenced by in the crucial year I worked with them in 88, 89. Certainly my tendency towards mass and deteriority and the capacity to hold one in space was learnt from Robinson Chen and continues to play out in our own housings. So a conundrum. I felt moved by Robinson Chen but wanting the intellectual challenge of Edmund and Corrigan. And I resented these sorts of false proles or tribalisms and these restrictive oppositions which Leon van Skyck captured in his various ideograms and developed a tripolar model for Melbourne architecture to counter that. And which led me to gradients via Steve Reich and his music for 18 musicians. 1983, waking to this one morning on the friend, to the floor of a friend's brother's Canberra's flat was an epiphany of sorts. It's pulsing rhythms, interweaving of different instruments, different voices, different tempos of increasing and diminishing dominance infiltrated my dreams, ever so gently moved me from asleep, dozing to awake. It encapsulated for me the concept of the gradient as a way to render the in-between, the transitional or the gray zones of so much more interest to me than the more definitive black and white ends of any spectrum. So between architecture and landscape, figure and ground, inside and outside, public and private, new and old, like and unlike. For me, gradient architecture became a tool for actually building the moments between the opposites or calibration. And it preempted and held clues to an ecological thinking of ecotones as gradients of ecologies. And these early, this early foolishness of asserting that a line that we draw could separate or be used to claim a site as utterly or only private seemed absurd, like the absurdity of ocean boundaries. And I want to read a quote from Jeff Park's Theatre Country by David Quanham. The carpet is 12 feet by 18, say. That gives us a 216 square feet of continuous woven material. Is the knife razor sharp? If not, we hone it. We set about cutting the carpet into 36 equal pieces, each one a rectangle, two feet by three. Never mind the hardwood floor, the severing fibres release small squeaky noises like the muted yelps of outraged Persian weavers. Never mind the weavers. When we finish cutting, we measure the individual pieces, total them up and find that, lo, there's still nearly 216 square feet of recognisably carpet-like stuff. But what does that amount to? Have we got 36 nice Persian throw rugs? No, all we've left is three dozen fragments, each one worthless and commencing to come apart. Jeff Park's writing in theatre country problematised for me how land subdivision, the promised autonomy of land ownership, fosters a connection, a conception of site as one of these separate pieces, disconnected and detached with no obligation beyond its own needs or its neighbours, let alone to a bigger context. So it reminded me that no matter whether we were dealing with urban, suburban or rural sites, it's always part of a continuum, a system. Water being an obvious example, because floods clearly don't respect property titles and many of our projects are in flood or fire zones. Um, hydrology diagrams in this 
show a sort of expanded sphere of special consequence and responsibility which become inevitable to account for our actions on sites that may impact beyond boundaries. An approach to sustainability of this course underpinned by this kind of thinking. But importantly too, it's not just what we see, it's not just the picturesque, but it's also a performative and a cultural landscape that was beginning, I was beginning to recognise. Um, in 1983, a major lesson for me came through walking the Lurajari Trail. This is an 80 kilometre walk or route along the coast of northwest Australia, the country of Paddy Rowe and his ancestors, the Gularabalu community. There's nothing like walking every day for a minimum of four hours, sometimes 14, to really appreciate the ground you might otherwise take for granted. An increased attuneness, sensitivity and capacity to see the minutest of variations in its condition. Tracks of creatures, subtle shifts in its resistance underfoot, its geology, its vegetation, its dry or wetness, its stability and so on hard and unforgiving and then gradually softening amongst mangroves where our legs sunk into mud to our thighs, our shoes sucked off and our toes a metre below feeling disconcertingly the roots of the mangroves. We're in crocodile country and was it really just the root of a mangrove and not the nose of a croc that I was feeling through my feet. Um, learning the language of the Roebuck Plains is not to discover in the same features of European landscapes. It's of a different order. There are hills and valleys to be found, but how frustrating for the European to find they're so slight. Fingers with their sparse covering of gum and wattle stretch out across the mudflats. We have to see the plains in terms of a series of tracks and in terms of underground sources of water." End of quote. Here I learnt that a landscape we as architects might describe as empty is in fact full of meaning and of stories. It's only our cultural lit illiteracy that stops us from reading it. It reinforced to me that physical space remains empty without a cultural framework, daily habits and practices to bring it to life. On that same trip, we made camp for a few days alongside a smattering of paper barks and a dry river bed. The women prepared our tucker amongst a cluster of eskies, they're what you keep things cool in, fold up tables and a fire pit formed with a sandy hollow. When kids came running too close, the women yelled, get out of the kitchen. It surprised me, but then I came to realise that of course, this makeshift arrangement was a kitchen, yes, because that's how they were using this settlement of sorts, which I've tried to sketch as you see below. It was architecture without walls. It was a fine counter to a learnt preoccupation with physical structures as evidence of occupation, a sentiment sadly still reflected in Australia's problematic relationship with its colonial history. Our attachment to place is formed in so many ways and architecture is but a strand of this attachment rather than the main event. We moved house a lot and my mother honed her immense skill at making home and quickly. Within the space of 24 hours, boxes were unpacked, household goods placed, arranged, so that on waking we were once again surrounded by familiar things, placed for our daily habits to settle into, even if at first the distance between table and fridge was greater, or orientation of a bedroom window was now a bit further east, or the stairs a little steeper than the last, the light a little brighter, the noises or sounds a little less foreboding. I appreciate how Bachelard describes these knowings through our memory or our bodies as a group of organic habits and notes too that the word habit, as he puts it, is too worn a word to express this passionate liaison of our bodies which do not forget with an unforgettable house. And so his discussions were very important to me of how these sorts of habits of being in our homes becomes embedded into our bodies. Um, this attention to making home and forging a relationship between house and occupant is central to our residential work and of course for that we look to many precedents. Um, I've always been fascinated by these sorts of surveys of other people's plans where you see their traits and their little habits, if you like, of making architecture come through and how that's influenced our own. This attention to making home, um, sorry, um, and how the ways in which this bond between person and eventual home or space is mutually defined. You, you adjust to the space, the space adjusts to you. And that's fascinating to me in our making of, of spaces. 
I think this attention of mind to an embodied experience of architecture stems also from a late 80s, early 90s post-structuralist studies, revisiting phenomenology of, say, Merleau-Ponty through a feminist lens of Iris Marion Young and her classic essay, Throwing Like a Girl, a linking of bodily comportment, training and experience of being in space and whether experiencing it as a comfort or a threat. So how might my own lived experience inform design directions or directly? And in the case of some toilets we did some time ago, thinking about what it means to use these, anticipating what it feels like and embedding that in the process. Sometimes I describe this way of anticipating in design a kinesthetic empathy, a kind of muscle memories at work here, I think, understood from years playing the violin. When watching and listening now to someone else playing it, I experiencing it, I experience it as an embodied memory. And I've thought that this projection of one's embodied self into another's action or space might be used to foster spatial empathy and to aid the design process, a heightened anticipation of the sensorial aspects of an eventual space while still in its imagined beginnings. I think this is how I or architects, we know a space well before it's built, its light, its coolness, its warmth, or its acoustic qualities. It's an attempt to put oneself in the other's shoes with the other being the eventual occupant. It may also relate to my being a synesthete, understanding or feeling numbers, letters um, within a gradient of lightness and darkness. Um, this overlapping of senses as a way of knowing, I think sometimes helps design. And it leads me to Tanizaki's much loved In Praise of Shadows, which captures my interest in darkness, a quality intrinsic to many of our interiors, um, as a device for resisting Australia's unrelenting quest from lightness or brightness uh, by offering a retreat of sorts. And this quote from Tanizaki, in making for ourselves a place to live, we first spread a parasol to throw a shadow on the earth, and in the pale light of the shadow, we put together a house. And certainly even that thinking, I think, informs some of Boyd's work, which I started with, this idea of the roof as parasol. Um, in Lake Ponawara, it disguises, the house disguises its figure, its objectness in the shadow as a black line inscribing a larger territory. Figure for me really is just the means to an end, which is interior space and territory. Similarly, the cut or the edit in the creation of a void is often more powerful than the addition, and I think Lacaton Vassal's influence on me here is considerable as well. What we take away, not just what we add. But going back to shadows, and more importantly, the absence of them, one of my earliest architectural pilgrimages was to Rossi and Inonimo's Galatarese. I was living in Milano at the time where I worked in the studio of Matteo Tun for half a year. Weekends were used to traipse out beyond the charms of the Gentile Risorico and witness the real Italy in its periferia. Here was a lesson on the ideal and the actual. As a student back in Melbourne, I'd been enraptured by Rossi's beautiful pen and ink depictions, his chiaroscuro, dichitico-like, using form to render shadows, the interplay of light and dark. So with these in mind, these images, these sketches, I ventured to Galateresi, but as is common in Milan, La Nebbia, the fog, had claimed the air around the white apparition and no shadows were to be found. Instead, a kind of dull, um, unoccupied and quite a cold or grim scene, not to take away from the architecture, of course. But it did make me wonder how, as architects, we sometimes can resist the very preconditions of the situation we are given to work with and the need for the ideal or the idea, the intent to fit this predominant condition, whatever that might be. This balancing of ideal and actual, of course, comes into place relentlessly on site. Here, best laid plans are disrupted or called into question by all sorts of unforeseen events, and the infamous character of architect and builder gets relitigated or rolled out in all its predictability of who wants what. With my uncle and my mother, they did a lot of building work, and for me, after school entertainment was often a visit to a half demolished house. I witnessed my mother comfortable in this space and equally comfortable sometimes doing the messy work on site. So for me, site as a workplace was always an option. During studies, I did a fair bit of work on site. At first, because I was otherwise pretty useless in an office when I first started, I had no CAD skills. But later, having done a lot of hospitality work, I could organise stuff and people. So when an end of year site party was needed, I helped make that happen. 
And because of that, my boss asked me what I would rather be doing, to which I said site work. So began my role with Robinson Chen as a go-between back and forth from building site to architect's office. And I learned a lot about buildability and parallel to that about drawing, how architecture, the lines we define it by, can direct, frustrate or align with the process of construction. And also about the art of improvising, something my father always encouraged, such as the time I lamented not having a paintbrush and him helping me make one with a snippet of hair, chopstick and a bit of fishing wire. How to realise the conceptual through a direct, sometimes conventional approach to making with prosaic materials, especially bricks. Bricks the substance of much of our architectural production. And I can attribute this material tendency in part to the time and place of my architectural education, Melbourne again in the 80s when postmodernism revived a preoccupation with our vernacular, with our terraces and the associative possibilities of masonry, ornamental opportunities of polychromatic brickwork, which played out in our Victorian and Edwardian streetscapes, later in broader suburban landscape. But there are many more personal reasons too. I started tonight's talk with questioning the extent to which personal experience overlaps with professional training, informing the repertoire of an architect. So I'm going to end that way too. Bricks are in the blood. My grandfather's family produced them in Germany for centuries and he invented the Habler kiln, which to this day remains reasonably energy efficient in remote situations where electricity is unavailable. I have one of his bricks, a treasured heirloom, which I dug up from Bohemian soil during a family tour in 2001. A red brick of Pilsen ground has found a resting place as doorstop alongside a differently red brick in the walls of a Fitzroy warehouse in Melbourne. Architecture is comprised of many histories, and as an Instagram wit posted the other day, everyone here is one of either First Nations, convict, migrant or refugee. Coming full circle, it makes some kind of sense that I, a child of a middle European refugee who formed part of Melbourne's diaspora, came from landscapes associated with dislocation and unspeakable trauma. Now. I apply these brick learnings to a building that in fact contains artefacts, stories and memories of one aspect of this past in Melbourne's Jewish Holocaust Centre, which is currently under construction and will, importantly, be able to have glass bricks to attest to the relative freedom here to speak of one's ancestry. Thank you for listening to these meanderings and I look forward to picking up some of these thoughts in our conversation to follow. Thank you for Hi. your thank you for your talk. Thank you. Um, can you hear me well? Yes, right. Yes, I can. Thanks. Yes, that's great. Um, this is really nice that you uh, finish with sentences like uh, "bricks are in my blood." In my blood. <laughs> um, I'm talking about your uh, the influence of your family and your past. Yeah. Um, actually, I have a quote of you. Um, saying, I shall credit my mom uh, with making it seem perfectly, no perfectly normal to be on a site. Yes. yes. Um, how have your mother influenced you throughout uh, your life? Can you tell us a bit more about uh, the influence? Um, I, think, I think certainly she taught me a lot about, um, I mean, apart from her heritage and how that infiltrates through you anyway, I remember she's always had an extremely um, pragmatic uh, trait as well. So, and I think sometimes, you know, my uncle really, especially she and her, were very suspicious of architects as these kind of idealists and these dreamers. <laughs> And so I would often, when I first said I wanted to be an architect, it was slightly, they were slightly horrified. Um, so I think I was always interested in how to bring something of a kind of a, a degree of common sense, but also an idealism and to match these two things. My mother was obsessed with hooks, you know, thinking where would someone need to hang something in a space? And so that very mm. um, immediate everyday thing was as important to me as a big idea you might have as an architect about some other thought. Mm. So that's one way, yeah. Actually, it's funny that you mentioned your uncle because yeah. uh, I have also a quote for, from him saying that- Oh no. Uh, he, saw, he saw the <laughs> architects as 
these slight, slightly difficult people. Yes. Sure. Now, decades later, um, how do you feel about this? Was he right? Yes. Well, he, used to, he told me a terrible story once of an architect, not me, another one, who came on site in a black velvet cape robe. And That's the way to do it. Asking, asking for it from the subbies. And um, he had very dusty hands from being on site and patted him on the back and it left the mark on the cape. So oh. I think this was their image of the architect and their disassociation from the site, which I think, again, because of my interest in site work, it was to try to bring those things together. I'm interested in that. Yeah. Yeah. Mm, that's very really nice. Um, actually, um, you, were, you were used to spend uh, one out of four weeks in New Zealand. That's right, uh, yeah. Uh, I guess this is not possible right now. <laughs> no, um, that's right. I would normally be doing exactly that. That's right. And how did this time away help your creative process and maybe also your work and life balance? Yeah. Um, I find the week away a really, I save it as a time to, to concentrate on design, especially. Mm. Um, that more, it's very focused time for me, even though I'm contactable and occasional meetings, and I think now life of COVID will have destroyed the refuge that that provided before, because now everyone is on Zoom. But it did provide a time to just do the sort of um, more research intensive background thinking to projects. Mm. And there's been some really important work I've done in that, in that period there, once I stopped teaching, which was what I was previously doing there. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Actually, um you were very engaged with education, and yes. you still are. But uh, in our previous previous meeting, you told us that uh, you are not no much not so much time right now. So maybe maybe yeah. in the near future. Yeah. Um, Always. How are you like? Oh, sorry. Sorry, I was just going to say. I think, um, especially with RMIT, there has always been this very close link, like I talked about before. Mm -hmm. And for me, uh, teaching has been a way to get clarity of thinking and then to, to teaching, I bring something of the messiness and contingency of practice. So I see them as very um, helpful to each other. Yeah, both in power mm -hmm. and And how do, how, um, what change would you like to, to see today in today's education? Uh, it's really interesting. It's a really good question. I think sometimes just the ordinary project is actually a really good project because mm -hmm. really we never, we don't generally choose a lot of the commissions we get given and I think it's the really ordinary brief that can be extraordinary is where our efforts are well spent. Um, so I care a lot about that type of project because you can bring a lot of ideas to the most perfunctory of briefs. And the other thing I would say is for a long time, housing here was seen as very unfashionable. Um, and I think now uh, people are starting to recognise just how important it is to do housing well, especially mm -hmm. with the sort of crisis that's everywhere, actually. So it's starting to be recognised again as a really important place for architectural thinking and endeavour. Maybe that's not news to you, but it has been a bit of a push here. Yeah. Well, that's again, great. Ordinary and every day, yeah. Mm. And um, I remember um, a talk of you with the topic ethics in architecture. Ah, oh, yes. Do yeah. do you recognize uh, your ethics in your so your personal ethics in your <clears throat> sorry in your early projects and in your current projects? Yeah, I think that 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 talk with was a sort of summer, summation, if you like, of how I was thinking about that and how any project um, can be practised in a way and real spatial impacts can come out through thinking that way. And really, I touched on it a little bit tonight when I talked about, you know, cutting up a rug or thinking about sites as disconnected, mm -hmm. that as soon as we understand that the site we work on through that and through our projects has a larger responsibility to what is beyond it. That for me is fundamental to our way of working. That we're always connected to something. We can either contribute and, and build that or we can destroy it. And that is the choice we face every day as architects in any kind of project. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
one of uh, your early choices um, was to to establish your own com your own architectural practice. Yeah. And uh, one of the reasons was um, to be able to balance mm -hmm. private life and professional life. Yeah. It was a good um, theory. <laughs> it, it didn't work. <laughs> I, I think I, th I think certainly um, there was a degree of choice there uh, because ultimately it was my problem if I didn't make that balance work. It, it's fair to say it's taken um, some time to try and not every day it works to try and get that balance for everyone else here as well. But I, I will say that it was trying to counter a myth that I saw here a lot, that unless you worked seven days a week, um, you know, 15 hour days, you couldn't mm. be serious about architecture. And I think that's a very poor basis for, um, for you know, good work to happen. It's, it's just mm. not sustainable. But as I say, some days are more balanced than other days. That's yeah. right. So I guess yeah. right now is nobody Nobody's at the office because everyone is enjoying life, um, so work and life That's balance. Right. Yeah, but I mean, I can notice too, even in this time of COVID, you know, it has put a lot of extra pressures on people. And I notice how much I see what time emails are coming in. I can see people are working long mm. hours at the moment. So it's slow, it's laborious working remotely like this. So it's mm. adding, it's not helping that balance in some way. Actually. Yeah. That um, regarding how are you um, working at these COVID times will, could be a question for the roundtable discussion. Sure. Maybe we, um, yeah, sure. we take it to the conversation later with John. Sure. So from now, um, first, thank you for your talk and for the interview. So and we will meet later in like 30 minutes for our okay. roundtable discussion. Right. Okay. Thanks, thank you. Thank you, Kirsten. Thank you. Thank you. Our second speaker was born in Geelong, near Melbourne. He studied architecture at the, Melbourne, at the Royal Melbourne Institute of Technology. In 1986, he established his own architectural practice, John World Architects, which has studios in Melbourne and Sydney. He has led the growth of the practice from working on small domestic dwellings to university buildings, museums and large commercial offices. Their work has been nationally and internationally awarded. Some of their most relevant projects are the Melbourne School of Design, Shearer's Quarters, Phoenix Central Park, Ian Potter Southbank Centre, Captain Kelly's Cottage or Kew Residence, a refurbishment of his own home in Melbourne. All of them amazing projects which won't be the topic of his talk today. Besides that, he was honored in 2020 with the Australian Institute of Architects' highest individual distinction, the gold medal. Congratulations for that. We are very excited to have him with us today. Welcome, John Worrell. Oh, thank you, Furman. Thank you for um, constructing the very idea of us coming together to uh, consider the sorts of things that have been influential in our life and practice. Um, and I've been particularly appreciative you've joined me together with Kirsten for this discussion as you've come from your side of the world to ours. Um, I'm going to take you on a rather distracted and deviating chronology of the influences of my life. Um, and if you can stick with the journey, it'll switch back and forth as, as place and time uh, swap over back and forth a fair bit during the course of this next 20 minutes or so. But it should start in Geelong, which is where I was born um, in the 1960s and 70s. Geelong was still functioning as the centre of the wool industry in this part of the world. Um, my father was an agricultural scientist and uh, science teacher and a very enthusiastic member of the Geelong Historical Society, uh, an organisation hell-bent on preserving the fabric of Geelong that at that time was being um, uh, destroyed at will. Uh, a great amount of destruction was done to the city at that time. I should say Geelong was a wonderful city to grow up in and remains that. And it's a city going undergoing remarkable transformation at this time. But 
One of the interesting aspects is about my father's deep interest in history and the fabric of the city was his friendship with Ken Burns, the local Geelong uh, wrecker, building wrecker. And we'd spend many weekends uh, on Saturday mornings down visiting Ken in his yard as my father would politely debate the loss of this historic fabric with Ken, the man who was actually responsible for demolishing it. Um, interestingly enough, at the end of these lengthy discussions, Dad would open up the back of his station wagon and Ken and I would help him load in the artefacts that actually Ken had kept from his latest mission and Dad would take them home for yet another building or garden project in, in, our, in our garden. So this sort of was a, a time of strong opinions but uh, held through polite conversation, a sort of a learning in transaction, I think. Um, I'd like to share with you um, a fragment of knowledge, of the knowledge of, of our history here that's always fascinated me and, and really directed some aspects of, of the work of our practice. And it is this, that in 1929, D.H. Lawrence arrived in Australia and uh, loathed every minute of it as he was travelling around writing his novel, Kangaroo. Um, and he signed forlornly at the bottom of each of his letters home, D.H. Lawrence, upside down at the bottom of the world. He, he meant it as a, as a curse, as he, as he really hated the place. But for me, it's a, it's a remarkable fragment uh, and a, a suggestion of really who we are here in Australia, adhered by gravity upside down at the underneath this massive hemisphere. Um, and it's our place in space, our part of the world. And, and so it makes us also aware that so many of our cultural practices are really cultivars have been uh, made elsewhere and adapted by the circumstances of life here in Australia, our parliamentary systems, so many of our cultural practices and, and sense of as ourselves comes from various other places. So this also to us celebrates this aspect of the rigour of hybridity, a, a, a horticultural term that talks about the vigour of, of, of the hybrid plant material is something I think can be attested to our uh, population. So I've had an interest in archaeology, a very amateurish sort of archaeology that sometimes borders on theft, but it starts with a story of me as a small boy. I, I bred bantams, um, as one did in Geelong in those days, and every so often I'd have saved up my pocket money and I would walk, it would take me about an hour to walk around the edge of the Barwon River over waterfalls and across weirs and around to this wonderful old farmhouse and a very eccentric family that bred bantams. I'd hand over my pocket money, stick a bantam under my shirt and then walk for about another hour up and down and around the Barwon Valley to home. The last time I took this small but epic journey uh, was to, upon arrival, discovering there our local demolition contractor was demolishing their house. They'd sold and moved on. But at that particular moment, uh, they'd taken off the lining and the roofing and this wonderful massive skeletal structure of, of the accretion of many generations of building revealed at its very centre uh, the original slab hut with a shingled roof that was still intact as that first bit of building of that family's history. I rushed in between the diggers, they stopped and chased me as I found a place inside the hut and found things and I scrambled around to find a series of things and this became my first ever archaeological dig and I've kept these items to this day. They join with many others as um, the builder's yard at Hadrian's Villa and also Villa d'Este. There are um, some road widening works near the pyramids of Giza um, rural Japan and every time I go to London, low tide on the Thames becomes a place uh, where I fossick around and find odd things. But things are, fascinatingly enough, uh, really evidence of aspects of the minute detail that defines a place and the culture of place. And to bring you back forward in time to a recent project of ours, this idea of elevating the prosaic and, and finding things that often when conjoined become uh, celebrated in, in a new relationship that can be formed. And this, when we were asked to be uh, designers of uh, a large exhibition of ceramics at Heidi Gallery here in Melbourne, we constructed out of 36 forlorn and unloved tables, one massive 20 metre long table, but through the territories that were created by the, the patterns within each, the zones that then the curators of the exhibition could create uh, spaces that would then define the various works. But then this idea of, of collection and, and elevation of the status of things is becoming very apparent. To take you back now uh, to my childhood, my parents 
met at university, at Melbourne University, and married immediately, and set out a plan that would extend it through the whole of their life, unlike any of the four siblings that they produced who have never planned forward in any aspect of their life ever since. Here we are leaving on the P&O Orchides uh, Station Pier in Melbourne. That's me concealed behind two sisters as we left for our journey of travels, which would take about 15 months. When we arrived in Great Britain, we settled down in Winchester and bought this already ancient Dormobile van. And this was our second home. We Every single weekend, we'd venture down to Cornwall or across to um, Wales or throughout some other part of the English countryside as a family of six in this van. In the summer holidays, extended our survey of Europe from the south of Italy right up to the very north of Norway. I often discuss these aspects of others have had similar experiences. It was a, a thing that some parents did during that time. And this idea of displacement, being taken out of the familiarity grounds of a school and having to find your way and form associations elsewhere. I think this attraction to the under, unfamiliar is often con common to many people that have this experience. And certainly in my own, it's the experiences that are very and acutely specific to space that I would say were rendered by this experience. I then came back, finished schooling, and uh, arrived at RMIT. Um, my first day at RMIT happened to be also Peter Corrigan's, and Kirsten's told her, told you her Peter Gor Corrigan stories, and they certainly overlap with mine. A remarkable architectural practitioner and educator, and really influential on a whole nearly two generations of, of um, Melbourne architects. For me, uh, he introduced the whole of our group to uh, to the theatre. And uh, at that time, particularly in the late 70s, uh, Australian theatre was going through a remarkable period. And we, through his urgings, uh, experienced so much of it. And I think that experience of parallel creative endeavour has always been enabled me to draw into our practice inspiration, not so much from conventional architectural discourse, but from parallel and others, other seemingly under, uh, unrelated areas of uh, creative idea making. Um, but it, he also, he just returned from America and he did a series of other fascinating things. Rather than just buildings that are produced by architects, he talked very much about the process and the practice of architecture. There was Paul Rudolph, uh, Venturi and Scott Brown, of course, uh, Philip Johnson, and particularly for me, Louis Kahn. Um, he described this displaced person, somebody from middle Europe that came to America and always practiced with as part of a larger group of architects working at that time, but very much as the outsider. Um, his life story the, and the stories of his, his work uh, were profoundly set by Corrigan in these early lectures. Many years later with my friend Nadir Tarani from NADA, we drove from New York, from Boston to New York, went by Yale to see his buildings, but also then he visited um, at the Exeter Library. To me, uh, an essay in moodiness, like no other building that I have ever uh, experienced. This remarkable building with so many lessons to be learnt about modality of, of light, the setting, the separation of materials, the sorts of things that create primary and secondary spaces in a really powerful hierarchy are all so evident in this wonderful uh, moody campus building. Um, and moving on from there, then to take you in a quick step from my graduation, um, uh, I worked then for a year at Cox and Carmichael, a wonderful Melbourne firm of architects, a firm that at that time gathered together a series of young uh, graduates that all then formed their own practices. I think 12 practices in all have come out of the one period of time at Cox and Carmichael that I, that I experience there and that nature of the generational aspect of practice has always then been a fascination. After working there for a year I was to return I headed to Europe in 1982. The sorts of things that we had only experienced as Australians by book or by, by lecture um, were then visited that went straight to see Chirun's Berlin Philharmonia, uh, sought out Chirun's Maison de Verre in a Paris street or the works of Cabuzier and Caesar and the great works, Brunelleschi's Duomo, to be revealed the artistry, the materials technology of that time, and of course, its engineering. But there's one profound lesson I'd like to share with you, 
and it's our trip to um, the Tetra Olimpico. In we arrived in Vicenza, went straight there to see Palladio's remarkable theatre, and also with the knowledge that Scamozzi's per perspectival sets were part of this whole remarkable compositional experience. We arrived, walked in, took our seats as the only people in the theatre, as if we dropped a coin into a box. An elderly Austra Italian uh, speaking English, he must have heard that we were English, uh, with an American accent, he must have learned from Americans after the war, started to, while well, remaining behind the set, started to recite the stories of the making of this remarkable building and the, the, the ambitions that the architect and set designer had. And at the same time, then he, he went into a deeper lesson about perspective. We still haven't seen, he's walking up and down these remarkable street sets of this advanced perspective as he talked about perspective itself and also the nature of perspective, that it's not just a visual, a, a visual acuity, that it also is experiential in many forms. And there is actually an oral perspective as he started to walk backward and forward to the, through these chambers to exhibit this, this characteristic. He then walked through the central portal, right to the very end of the stage, and then looked out to his audience. Talking, looking straight ahead, he continued to, um, to provide his summary of, of this of this great building. But of course, we were sitting off to one side and we realised at that moment that we just had the most remarkable lesson on perspective delivered by a blind Italian. Now that lesson was so profound and I think it's been told, I must apologise to all of my staff who've heard this story many times before, as well as architecture students across Australia. But for us, it really enlivens so much of our understanding of this and, and this fascination that we have with perspective. That cognitive process of perception of scale and distance, the way we register our place in space and are aware of all that it sits beyond, is, is part of the really uh, uh, important responsibility of architects to actually provide architecture that has aspects of enclosure that both um, contain the dynamic of human life but also express its place in the world, in, in, the, uh, in the, the civic experience and the urban environments that we also work within. So, so many aspects of our work actually refer back to this powerful influence. And years later, in 2018, we were invited into the Venice Biennale with their theme, Free Space. It caused us to reflect on the nature of space, its memory, perception, and the inherited cultural layers that comes with our understanding of, of the variance of space and merging these to find things that are both specific to place but then universally appreciated became very much part of that equation. Now we knew and considered some of these lessons through the way we orchestrate the vision towards space. In Australia here we have had our famous bush ranger Ned Kelly who fashioned his own suit of armour with a slit, um, pillar box slit of a rectilinear format that he looked out into the Australian landscape. For us, the knowledge of this has really been portrayed by the work of Sidney Nolan, the great 20th century artist. Considering the another version of this, the tight anthropometric fit of the Venetian mask and the, the way the celebrated understandings of the, of the reason why the mask exists and the kind of opportunity for looking through those very tight pinholes to, to life in Venice. So we came up with the idea of somewhere other for us, it was not a building, not a marquette, or not representing of anything much of our work, but it really very much a, a, an instrument, a place that looks beyond the confines of its place here in the Arsenale in Venice. And it plays on our perception of space and the, uh, as we imagine somewhere well beyond. Now, if I can take you back in time to complete the trip in Europe, uh, we went then back to England where we looked at the works of um, right through the British Isles uh, uh, and looking at, at Lutyens, Voisy and, and uh, Charles Rennie Mackintosh as we drove the length of Britain from south from Castle Drogo right up to the deep north. We just got to the very top of Scotland and I read in the newspaper that Elvis Costello and the Attractions had just completed their American tour and were playing one concert in in the South Hampton Gaumont before heading across to Europe. We drove the length of, of, of England in 24 hours to get to that remarkable concert. Uh, a fantastic musical experience at the time when they were going through a particularly angry stage and said not a word to their audience, but it left still such a profound rendering of the incredible music of that time. I then came back 
graduate uh, and, and formed a practice after a, a shorter period of time at Cox and Carmichael. In 2001, I, um, I did my master's at RMIT with Leon Van Skyke, uh, a, a educator and critic. And uh, this object called a music stand for a middle child was really evidence of the thinking and, and the methodologies that have been employed in the practice right up until that period of time. But of course, I've continued to be a collector, mainly now through the junk markets of the world from Tokyo to Ljubljana to Copenhagen, but then enjoy the aspect of, of assembly, of, of finding uh, aspects of memory that's triggered by these objects and the serendipitous communality of, of things that are varied but somehow share some common attribute. So when I look at my own house, I do have this aesthetic interest in objects. What I'm more interested in is the backstory, the, the who made them, the what caused them to be made and when were they made and what kind of technologies were employed and cultural imperatives that were actually in place in those regions to produce those works. And we can draw these into the places that we make work. And here, our interest in the lineage of a city is profoundly set. We've uh, com recently completed Melbourne's Conservatorium of Music. And in amongst is this tightly grained feature of Melbourne where so many Melbourne architects have worked for such a long period of time. Kirsten's work is just sits in behind ours in, in the Victorian College of Arts. There's an assembly of a, a series of Melbourne architects. But what's perhaps more interesting is the re that representation of the lineage of a city, that network of influences, and the, uh, uh, particularly of subsequent generations, and the, uh, the cultural references, both from within Melbourne, across Australia, and beyond that's evidenced in these areas. Um, now, I have to be careful with this small thesis because we're working in China at the moment and greatly enjoying it. But we must be aware that we can, when we work in places other than our own, draw great cultural benefit in doing so and other aspects of, of introducing the work of an outsider into a, a new region or territory. But at the same time, we must be aware that well, there is a, an, ev an evidence of disruption to their DNA of the map of that place. I'm aware that our practice is very much one of collaborative experience. The evidence that we often find in that sole authorship of the drawing is now much more of a blurred entity as we see drawing and drawing over drawings. And now particularly with COVID, this evidence through our shared digital whiteboards of that idea of the invested experience uh, being registered on these boards that really now tell a much clearer story in some ways of the entire journey of the inception of a project. We also look very carefully at the cultural values that we employ with our work. We've, we've formed long liaisons with, with, architect, with artists over many years and appreciate the extensions of narratives that artists bring to architectural practice. Uh, we in our practice have a thing called On Top of the World where we engage artists, we commission them to design a flag, an invited audience celebrates the raising of the flag and then we listen as they tell us about their art practice generally to an audience of architects. But we've, for a few years also, we've actually invested time by delving into industry and, and knowing, having a, a greater knowledge of industrial practice. What's interesting in the time that we now work, we're very aware of the loss of some aspects of craft as, as global economies have caused the, uh, the compaction and, and loss of some of the traditional crafts, but it's also an area of great invention of new craft. If the 20th century is about mass industrial processes and, and standardization, the 21st century more like is more like the 18th, where this infusion of craft and technology allows for the, for the aberrant and the discordant and the unusual to occur within the pattern. And as part of this, we become students of others. We go to Bruni Island to a farm that the practice has there every year and we, rather than, the, than providing the information for others to make, we coerce others uh, and very brilliant others to teach us to make. So we become the students of, of, um, of carpenters and furniture makers, uh, kiln makers, stonemasons and, and technologists and others that then guide us into this process of making. One of the interesting aspects of it is the sheer physicality of work over those three intense days is something that is uh, an important lesson for young architects. And we talk about landscape, and it was interesting hearing Kirsten's perspective on this. 
What's interesting is really is the profound and recent discovery of things that have been to somewhat ignored. And these two books, more than most, and a lot of very recent research, has now brought our attention to this remarkable but ancient, sophisticated indigenous land management that has been so evident but un misunderstood or unnoticed uh, in, in the history of our continent since European settlement. In, in place across this wide open continent, um, before, to, before European settlement took place, was a very sophisticated series of, um, of, of farming practices, horticulture and aquaculture that is now being drawn to our attention, really, and embarrassingly so for the first time. Many of these Indigenous techniques will now be find new uses as we look at the enormous ramifications of the bushfires through global warming and many aspects of the devastation of our landscape. The lessons are there to be learnt that are particularly ancient and ever, and ever present in our landscape. So I particularly refer to this place on Bruni Island. It is uh, it, it continues to inspire me personally. It's also a very private place that's shared with many others. Its layers of history are so openly stated. It is very obvious the Indigenous settlement on, on this land, on the coastal edge of Tasmania. Its colonial landscape is obviously present and now it's going through a state of repair. So the, the contemporary landscape is one of repair. So the, these layers of history can be seen much more evident uh, in, in this place than any place I know. And to end with a story, and um, this really is a story very much about our practice, which is probably similar to many, but one that is, is now deeply understood in our practice as it's grown to really uh, encompass the contributions of so many people. So four years ago, Trump had just taken the White House uh, he was threatening a wall between America and Mexico. Um, Syrians were marching across Europe trying to find safe haven from warfare. And while not of similar or cataclysmic proportions, our practice turned 30 and we produced a book. And I had to uh, present a speech at, at this anniversary and, and the book launch. And so at the last moment while I was putting my speech together, I sent a questionnaire around to the staff to ask them where they were born, what university they were educated at and where their parents were, were born. And this started a, an interest in the statistics of the, of the, uh, of the genome of our practice. Um, and later that year, when searching for ideas for our annual Christmas present, one of the elements of the present were, for those who wished to was a DNA test. And then we spent the next rest of that year sharing the evidence of our own individual DNAs that became part of the collective experience of the practice through all sorts of lectures, talks, ceremonies, lunches, and, and, and so forth. At the end of it, and with collaborator, constant collaborator, Simon Lloyd, I designed this bowl called the Upside Down at the Bottom of the World Bowl that um, to me was a summation of all that we had put into that year. But what was particularly interesting is uh, under their own guidance, the staff took that on and, and, and set up a competition where they all looked at uses for this otherwise relatively um, uses for this otherwise relatively useless object that I had created. And so in doing so, they, through a shared purpose, found use and purpose for an artefact. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? I can. Yes, that's great. Yes, that's great. Actually, one of my questions um, was about uh, about Bruny Island. So it was interesting to see um, how it is for you and what you look for and what kind of experience, experiences do you have when you go there. And also really nice to see that uh, that kind of DNA test that was uh, a nice idea to see how um, yeah how is the collectivity within us. Um, I have several questions, but we only have five minutes, so let's do it quick. Um, you have mentioned so many of your passions in your talk. Uh, how do you manage to find enough time to pursue them? Um, <laughs> uh, with the help of others, I'm very needy within the practice. and I'm supported by some remarkable people that do so many things that I 
don't have to do or, or they do better. Um, uh, th but I do spend long hours awake. I, I enjoy the link back to Bruni Island, the other things that I do. Um, and so the, the out of hours time is consumed by family, uh, but by also by so many other things. But I think I've also, along the years, I've certainly found wo woven family life into work life constantly. Our kids grew up in the practice when they were younger. Um, and then these other aspects like Bruni Island, which really started off as a private place to retreat through, has now become part an annex for, for the for the practice itself. So part of it is that not separating things, is actually drawing things together and allowing the, the edges to be blurred. And um, actually it's funny to see that uh, it was funny to see this uh, van with your family. You were six people in that in that car. It was yeah. <laughs> it was amazing. Um, can you tell tell us about um, your experience growing up that uh, that maybe filled um, filled you filled your passion for collecting? So your interest for collecting. What kind of experiences um, make you feel that? Well, way? I, I, I think I get my deep history, the appreciation of history, particularly through both parents, particularly to my father, who also collected anything on the history of science. Um, and it was that was his big thing. Um, uh, and I, I think that's probably it. And those experiences in Geelong, the kind of house we grew up with, which was full of um, artifacts and things became something that be, that I've sort of brought with me throughout the rest of my life. I think it's mm -hmm. interesting, the pla architectural practice does allow these things. I mean, at work, I've got a huge collection of things. It's called the Museum of Stolen Objects but it's mainly things found on building sites over the years. So it's not really, again, it's the, the, it's the opportunities for such things are ever present um, mm. and, and, and certainly not separated from architectural practices. We know it. How, be, how big is your collection? Can you, you know how many pieces do you have? <laughs> no idea. I've, I've never, I don't trade in, I've never sold or given anything away. It's, it's, um, it's substantial, but, Interesting enough, it's, it's it's not it's not at all valuable. I, I, years ago, I was a magazine, uh, a design magazine, New Map. They were doing a thing on collectors, and they wanted to interview two collectors. Um, and they came to my office, and I asked the journalist, "Okay, so what's this about?" And he told me about it. And I said, "Well, what does the other guy collect?" And he said, "Maseratis." So I said, "Okay, well, you can <laughs> subtitle subtitle my collection. Nothing over two hundred dollars." And it's sort of is it. Most of the things are individually of very little value, but I have my own value I place on them. Actually, it's nice to see that you are at home and you can, we can see so many things that you have in the background. Um, there is a question from the audience who might be interested at this point, um, which is how essential it's to be enriched and to pursue hobbies and interests outside of architecture. I think I got all of that. Well, the, the, particularly the end bit outside of architecture. I mean, I really just roll the whole thing all in together. I don't just, I mean, the, the, the day goes on. I really don't, um, I don't differentiate greatly mm. between the two. Um, uh, and, and so I, I, I don't, I, I think, yeah, as I said before, I don't feel that there is a, a great separation between much at all that I do between family, the collecting, the travel and other things and work itself, mm. it seems to it seems to um, manage that uh, the time spread over a series of other things that otherwise could be competing interests, but tend not to. Um, actually, now having the possibility to look uh, back at your path and your development, this year you have uh, been awarded with a gold medal. Um, how does it feel? How does it feel for you? Um, very good. That was great. It was wonderful to be um, awarded this. Um, I think, though, I mean, when I accepted it, I did say, and I, I think architectural practice generally is uh, a shared experience, and, and this is a, and our practice particularly, I think, from really from almost the start has been one of um, I've orchestrated the uh, the creative output of of many. So there's many within the practice, particularly people who've been 
we've been together for a long period of time that share in that reward. It does tend to individualize. Um, and so moments like yeah, this have been interesting right. as I prepare to do my gold medal talk. Uh, you've triggered my having to research into these sorts of things that uh, have have directed my fascinations and, and uh, endeavors. Mm. But it is very much, I think, um, I, th I would imagine such a thing just on just about any practitioner is something to be shared with others. And ours uh, is, I think, in, in my case, is very much a, a gold medal share. Mm. I understand that. Uh, did you have the opportunity to uh, receive the award, or it's because it was during the, during the lockdown, right? Yeah, it's interesting because I procrastinated whether I wanted my middle name, which I was always a bit embarrassed about, on the gold medal. I, I, I changed my mind and asked, yes, could they please put put it in? And for some reason, it's caused the delay in, in it being struck in in the mint in Canberra. But the gold medal apparently is on its way. But I'm in. Mm. Um, in February, March of next year, doing a delayed gold medal tour. Um, I should be doing it right now. It was to be in October, November of this year okay. because of COVID um, with the, all of the closing of the borders. It will now be hopefully February, March next year. Um, because as you probably know, we were in touch with the Australian Institute of Architects. Um, have you been in Germany lately? No, right? When was no, the last time? No. Maybe you have to come because maybe is this, oh, is this the fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> Do you I'm want not... it? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I, um, uh, the Australian Institute uh, told us that uh, you don't, you still don't have it because of this uh, this situation around yeah. the world with uh, yeah. COVID. I will say let's go for the uh, roundtable discussion. You say, you say that uh, architecture is a shared experience, so let's uh, uh, start a conversation with uh, with Kesten as well. So I will ask Kesten to turn on the camera and the microphone. Hi again. Hello. Yeah. Thank you, John. That's great. That was fascinating. Yeah. yeah. It was super interesting to uh, have the opportunity to get to know you because. Um, um, even from from here, from Europe, it's even more um, this way that we maybe we know your projects, but it's very difficult to get to know you and know your internet. So that was that has been fascinating. There is um, one question, Kessina. As we were talking, um, we mentioned COVID, COVID time, and how were you doing? Um, and actually, actually, I remember uh, in the previous meeting with. Uh, with John telling us that actually he enjoyed the lockdown. So can you share with us and with the audience how <laughs> how was the experience of uh, or how it's going right now and how are you doing with this COVID situation? Um, I think I agree with John that, uh, I mean, I was fortunate in that my day to day was less disrupted than for many people. Um, and I have on the one hand, quite enjoyed being able to just focus on the day's work and then not have all those extra things that we seem to fill calendars with, like, you know, well, mm. um, lots of teaching or extra lectures and things, which are all very rewarding and I really love to do, but there's something very nice about not uh, being allowed to go out into the world and just retreating to home. So that part of it I've liked quite a lot and um, sharing space with lots of people again could be quite confronting. So I think for some of us more introverted, it's been, um, it's had some pleasant things about it. But, but I think what I was also saying too, it has put a lot of, um, a layer of exhaustion on on the effort that's required to communicate and we've started some projects during this period and you're building relationships with people you've never met other than through the screen and that's quite strange all of the ways in which mm. you become familiar with people um, you can't rely on so yeah and John how was how is it going well, now we don't have, have lockdown. We have lockdown in Germany, but you and yeah. right now, no? Oh, yeah, well, we, we, we had a very, very strict lockdown. Um, 
Oh, look, and, and Kirsten and I discussed this the other day, and I think it's our experiences are similar. I mean, I went into lockdown with it, um, desperately missing the powerful coalition of staff, and, and, and I've always been one somebody very reliant on others in every aspect of practice, and and the idea of being totally on my own was was really terrifying. I think the first 10 months, two months, I didn't enjoy it at all, but I have to admit that it's probably I've been more efficient than I've ever been in my entire working life. Mm. It's remarkable efficiency, and there's aspects of of the solitude that are, have been really quite rewarding. I think at the same time we have been amazingly connected. I don't through obviously the various technologies as a practice we've been highly connected, but also then the links across to others. And I think mm. there's an enforced sociability. We've become We've, I think we're all a bit sick of the Zoom meetings and things by now, but that's allowed us to have a vast network of people and access to people that may not have otherwise um, come together in a group to discuss particular issues. I think that accessibility through this yeah. technology has been quite remarkable. Um, we've spanned mm. places more than we would have ever done without having to be on, on aeroplanes or anything so yeah it's had its advantages we hope it doesn't continue much longer but we have it has had these advantages <laughs> actually also it helps to bring the uh, light spot on architecture and the uh, casting was mentioning housing and uh, we realize how important it is to feel comfortable absolutely. at home absolutely i think i think that's something we've really noticed um even on some public housing projects at the moment where a few years ago it felt like it was falling on deaf ears, the sorts of emphasis that we were, as architects, putting on quality housing design. And now, after people have experienced lockdown, I really hope people, especially authorities who are commissioning and, and funding these projects in government, remember what it was like to not have people with the benefit or opportunity of decent housing, because that's, I think, what really set people apart of how comfortable or not this experience has been. And um, yeah, so I think I say that, you know, parts of COVID were fine because I did have a level of comfort with home, which I know others didn't have. And it sounds excruciating to be in an, mm. in an apartment, no access to outside, uh, reliant on lifts shared by hundreds of others, you know, it's, that, that is really complex. So may those lessons infiltrate for better housing in the future. And, and I think there's also something that's really evidence here. We had the, our five kilometre zone. So in a way it was an amazing experience of mapping the city where if you put a five kilometre template over different parts of the city, you see remarkable social inequity of um, mm. access to green, to where the, 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 the major cultural facilities are, even shopping and, and so forth, and that the unevenness of, of the spread of, of so many aspects that are so important in a city when yeah. you are locked into a small regional area is really fascinating. But I think also then that regional identity has been interesting. We've, as a community, you know, we've been pretty proud of ourselves in Victoria as a community. We've... we've um, resolved enormous issues of, of the, the, the spread of COVID. And it's something that has been a, a collective experience, which mm. not everybody has been on the same accord, level of accord with it. But it, the, the, as we come out of it and, and appreciate what as a community we've done, there's been some interesting aspects of that also, I think. I think too, how surprising it is that when you're in lockdown and you have a limited sphere, even then, the most familiar of streets, you notice things you've never noticed before. Like, I'm so surprised and in a strange way delighted by the fact that streets and neighbourhoods I thought I knew really well, I actually didn't. And so mm. there's something about what you see, there's always more to find, I think, is what it's, it's made very apparent or reminded me of, this is how you look. So you bo you both talked in your talks about curiosity and empathy, and how it helps the architecture. So maybe this whole situation even makes you try even more harder to empathy um, mm. with other people. Mm. Mm. I don't know how um, 
Well, maybe another way to put it is I think I think when there has been a lack of empathy in design, it shows. You know, when when you you know, as problematic as it is to sometimes say I'll put myself in your shoes, you know, that's not always easy to do. But I do think it's. Um, it is a necessity of what we do to try and anticipate what something will be like and to um, to respond to that. Yeah. Mm. I, yeah. I remember, is it, yeah, it's, you know, even years ago at RMIT and sitting in a relatively new building and just thinking that whoever had um, drawn that space had perhaps not thought about what it was like to sit in a particular way which was the main way you occupied it it would it frustrated your you know view out and so on and so it, it made me think a lot about just being aware of what you're setting up and how it will be experienced in the future yeah Chandra yeah. what you wanted to say something Oh, I, I just—I think the two go hand in hand. I think if you—if you are curious by by very nature, to be curious is to be relatively empathetic. It's you are getting out beyond your own experience and inquiring of others somehow. I think to be truly curious as a person, which probably is something that's um, that's spread is, is typical to many architects. It is that moment of of. Um, reaching out and and being genuinely curious is an is an empathetic act i think mm. there's one question from the audience um asking how do you feel uh is the most challenging part of being an architect today gosh john <laughs> oh it's, it's interesting um i mean i think we're Coming out of COVID, today really is is the world experiencing a, an extended period of COVID, or, or actually a pronounced end to it. And um, I think um, there's so many aspects of change that had been considered or were slowly underway that have been accelerated through this um, process. Mm. How we arrive at how, how we work, um, how we arrive at work, how we inter interact in the city. There's so many things that will be change forever so we are going to ex head into a period of i think hopefully accelerated change um and architects are always agents for change generally when you look through history we've in buildings you see evidence of a change of a mindset in the way families want to live or a university wants to educate or a commercial building wants to have its workforce experience work life it's generally expressive in 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 the work that we do so we're in an interesting place it's whether at the same time we can weather the the pressures that our profession is under certainly here in australia and and i'm sure elsewhere of um of a highly competitive and, and possibly a lowering of our fees uh, and a, a, a disempowerment of of what architects so frequently do when they take carriage of a client's brief and turn that into a building, which is what we're meant to do without the separation between client and architect, which is to us fundamental of that relationship and that translation. Those sorts of pressures at a time when the potential for great change and us to herald great change is there, is this sort of, this um, the stress in the situation, I think. Mm. Mm. Yeah. yeah. I think I, the only thing I would add to that, and I agree, is um, it's just to do with how how we manage our time. It seems that there mm -hmm. just always seems to be a greater number of things on our list. It seems like it's expanding, and I don't know if any every generation says that, but it does seem to me like. Um, if I compare the number of folders on a project from 15 years ago, it seems like now the same project would have a lot more folders. There's this proliferation of process, really, yeah. some of which mm. I wonder how much it actually necessarily gets a better outcome. But so what kind of, what, what, um, what do you try to avoid or what kind of activities do you consider a waste of time? <laughs> um, I, 
I think any kind of form filling is probably my least favourite and um, something that I'm deliberately not, uh, not, not skilled at. I can do it if I have to, but uh, that's definitely um, less desirable for me. I think, I think process for the sake of process um, is something I get frustrated by. And because time mm. is just so precious, and so I think to um, to find, you know, and in that sense, a, a lot of it is about trying to clear time sometimes or clear space for the sort of thinking that we need. Um, I mean, I will say that, uh, you know, when I when I first had my child, and I learnt to um, to complete a task within the time that Finn was asleep for. So I became quite good at juggling a lot of things in very short periods of time. But it's almost like you become so fast that you need to unlearn that and find ways to just go into a level of focus sometimes too and sort of get getting lost in time, which is quite hard. So. Yeah. What about you, John? Oh, I think Kirsten's answered that beautifully. I, it's exactly the same thing. <laughs> that time and space to think and be. I mean, I think as we've come out of COVID, had I known it was going to last so long, I would have felt by then I would have solved so many <laughs> issues and invented so many new things as a practice and have done all of those things. That, and um, I haven't done that. I mean, the, 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 our experience hopefully is nearly over here. And I think, gosh, in, that, in those 29 weeks or 30 odd weeks, I was there not greater space for me to actually separate myself from the daily flow of work and just dwell um, and luxuriate in time. That's, yeah. that's it for me too. I, I stupidly pulled my violin out again, which I hadn't played for a very long time. And I thought, you know, just before the first lockdown, I thought I'll go and get a new bow because the hair had all fallen off and and of course how long did that great intention last maybe two weeks of a bit of practice and then the world just came back so it's very hard to undo some of those habits yeah Kirsten if we will have known about this passion you could play a, we could have oh. a concert of yours <laughs> yes. I think we didn't know that before my audience if that happened um, I have a a quote from uh, you, Kerstin, saying that Melbourne as a design city needs, needs to lift its game. Do you, do you still, still think like this? Uh, I do. Uh, I mean, I, I think it's fair to say probably every city has to lift its game. Yeah. But <laughs> I, think, I think, you know, Melbourne does hold itself out as a design city, and I think some of that is warranted. Um, there is a very strong culture here of thinking about architecture and a very strong um, number of practices and a diversity of practices thinking really intelligently about architecture. But unfortunately, that doesn't always manifest in the buildings and in the processes that produce them. And so, you know, as I said earlier, we can all talk about what the problems might be of some of our key building types, like, for instance, high-rise housing. But it doesn't necessarily it gets talked about and then not acted on. So I think yes, we definitely need to not fall for thinking that talking about it is necessarily achieving the outcomes that it should, and that just requires so much effort on our part to push for that and to advocate. And, but that is where I think design is always about advocacy and it's it's part of our job to, to do that, yeah. And what do you think? Do you agree with that, uh, John? Yeah, I, I think um, I, I think we both reside and practice in a, in a great city, but no doubt about it, there's been things that have happened there over this last very short space of time, probably about a decade that actually has reduced the value of parts of our city with some of the great areas of high density that have been a, a created without the companion of, 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 of shared space and, 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 and sort of a, a equity of valuing of, of the part of the city that mm -hmm. this tremendous change has, has taken place in. Um, yeah, and there's been a, a real sense of loss with that. I mean, I think the world over, there's, there's, as our 
profession exists. Um, it's it, it, we don't speak with the same voice. There's some remarkable architects doing great work, and there's also others that um, really at the the call sign is more the, more the developer than the architect. We can rec recognise buildings by the developers who built them rather than the architects that mm. have been a party to it, which is a terrible testament, I think, mm. to that this phase of building that we've gone through here and elsewhere. Mm. Mm. I think too, though, that's um, partly for us. You know, I don't like to whinge about or grizzle about. Um, how difficult it is to practice and I think that's where I try to remain optimistic that you can try to find ways around the obstacles that are inevitable. It's just some oh, yeah. days it feels a lot harder than others, that's all. So, yeah. <laughs> Actually, I had a question on, the, on that topic on failure, failure and how we can learn about that. But maybe um, one last question because um, we are um, running out of time. As um, some of our um, viewers are students, um, what advice will you have loved to have during your teenage years? Cool. John? <laughs> um, um, well, I mean, probably to just to enjoy the variance of every moment as it occurs. It's a bit like we are here stuck in COVID. Um, the time passes so rapidly when, when in putting this mm. talk together to see things that seem fairly recent to me and now ancient history, uh, that appreciation of every aspect of time and, and the mm. occurrence of things within patterns of time to appreciate. I think also to appreciate in the pitfalls and the losses and the disappointments that somehow for most of us, the fortunate mm. things seem to have an, a reason for the occurrences and just to weather the storms and understand the ebbs and flows of, of life's experience. Cause generally the path will get you to somewhere where it seems fate determined you be. Mm. Yeah. Sounds great. What do you think, Kirsten? Um, I think, one thing I would say to students, and you know, so because sometimes they ask me if they're having trouble getting a job or whatever, and I do, I think one thing that was really important to me was that I did a lot of different types of jobs and they were strangely really um, helpful towards how I ended up practicing. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, something, and I touched on that tonight, how something as strange as doing hospitality work meant that I felt able to do site work and so to be to to sometimes take take an offer which might not seem quite right but there may be something from that that you just didn't foresee and um you know it's a bit like the neighborhood thing really isn't it you think there's nothing there and then you look a bit harder and there is and so to try and build on that but the only other thing too is um is to just, I think, really the the working with people side of architecture is just so important. I know John's touched on it a lot about the practice, but I think in terms of very noisy bikes, um, <laughs> what we teach in education of architecture too is how you work relative to others. And I mean, you know, buildings need to work relative to other buildings and we need to work relative to other people. And it's it's building skills around that that I just think is fundamental to what we do. Mm. That sounds great. That uh, has been a pleasure to have the possibility to talk with you. Um, I wish we can meet in the future. We look forward to visit Melbourne so. somewhere. Um, let us know if you come to Germany, to Hamburg, I will yeah. show you around. Um, thank you a lot for your time. It was a huge pleasure. And uh, also thank a lot to our partners and mainly uh, the Australian Institute of Architects. Thank you to, uh, to the audience for watching and being there. So it has been a pleasure. Thanks a lot. Have a, a nice evening. Or if you are in, in Europe, have a nice day and see you soon. But it was great. Thank you. Thank you a lot.
Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks a lot. You too.